Ali Shahabi is the founder of the Arabia Foundation. It's a Washington-based think tank which describes itself as specialising in the geopolitics of the Arabian Peninsula. David Hurst is the editor-in-chief of the online news website Middle East Eye. First, Ali Shahabi. We know he's in a hurry. What about his destination? Well, it certainly is all to the good because the country, uh, you know, had been ruled by elderly gentlemen for the last 40, 50 years. And a, a very large number of issues had been kicked down the road and not dealt with. And he has come in in the last two, three years and handled a lot of complex and very d- difficult files with a lot of courage. Now, he has a lot on his plate and he has to do a lot and he's doing it quickly, which, you know, while people may criticize that, it's much better than not doing it at all or doing it slowly over 40 years, as was the past case. David Hurst, what do you make of the fact that he's achieving a lot in a a small amount of time? Well, in human rights terms, what we have is, according to the British organisation Reprieve, uh, one of the most brutal leaders in the kingdom's modern history. Under him, executions have doubled in the first eight months of this year from uh, 67 to 133. There are reformers, uh, brave economic reformers, and there are brave uh, democratic voices. So one of them is a man called, a preacher called Salman al odah who was taken from his home on the 10th of September. He hasn't been charged with any crime. He's kept in solitary confinement. He was shackled. He's been subjected to 24-hour bouts of interrogation. Okay. And what you would ask is his crime. His crime is that he tweeted in favour of reconciliation between the kingdom and Qatar. Ali Shahabi, uh, so he's maybe a man in the hurry, but he's also a man who brooks no dissent. Well, democracies or multi-party political structures in the developing world have never been able to affect change quickly. And the successful models have all been authoritarian. So, yes, he so is authoritarian. So it's good that he's a dictator. Well, it, dictator is a word. Authoritarian is another word. He's a benevolent authoritarian ruler now. Well, it doesn't sound like he's very benevolent if he's executing more people at a faster rate than ever before. That is a misnomer because the executions are for drug trafficking, mostly, and for crimes. And they are not for political acts. And David Hurst is using, you know, the term very loosely. But these are criminal acts of where execution is used and not political acts. David so Hirst, it's a big if, difference. OK, and David Hirst, if I could just keep it on the domestic agenda for the time being. I mean, yes, Saudi Arabia, I don't think anybody would claim that it's a democracy, but he is liberalising things for women. He is saying he wants to clamp down on corruption. He is saying he wants to uh, modernise the economy away from a reliance on oil. I mean, These he, things are to be applauded, aren't they? He's saying this. Whether this is actually happening is what the debate is all about. And I would be absolutely the first to applaud Mohammed bin Salman or any ruler who is actually changing the system. Um, let me give you the case of Amr just, Dabak. Just, just very briefly, because we, we haven't got time to go sure. too heavily into it. OK, he's, he's a businessman who is the head of the Saudi Arabia General Investment Authority, who is credited with having moved the kingdom from 64th to 11th on the World Bank's list of business competitive nations. You would expect someone like Dabak to be at Mohammed bin Salman's side because he's a reformer. He's actually being accused of corruption. He's been tortured, according to his family, and he's now agreed to surrender his assets. Now, purely in terms of stability and purely in terms of economic, uh, moving the nation on, what lesson would that give other businessmen, Saudi or direct foreign investors, who would say, is my money safe? Am I safe? Okay. To invest in Saudi Arabia, if this is let what me, he does to someone like Dubai. Let, let me move Look, on to. Uh, I mean, uh, no, no, one Ali, second, David. I mean, examples are being given, which frankly are not correct. First of all, you have no way of knowing, uh, Mr. Hurst, if Mr. Dabar was corrupt or not. In fact, you know, without his reputation, but when he me, was in that there's space... There's no due process attached. No, there's no charge. It, you, there's exactly. no court. There is no... He hasn't been... I know this yes. from his relatives. Let's, well, let me, let me know, explain I, that. I, I, this um, is not, there is a um, challenge. There is a challenge to have to affect, to send the message to the ruling elites that behavior has to change and to deal with three to 500 members of the elite you could not have the proper due process that you would have had in England because it would have taken years. It would okay, have taken let, a decade. Gentlemen, so, let me, if I can, let, can me, let me move on to affairs outside Saudi Arabia because obviously it has huge import in the region. In fact, uh, many people see Mohammed bin Salman as perhaps the most powerful man in the Middle East. Let me talk about Yemen. Ali Shahabi, as you will be aware, 
Although Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of the Yemeni government in its uh, in what it's doing in Yemen, although there was a UN resolution that paved the way for Saudi involvement, that Saudi involvement is causing tremendous distress. The world's worst humanitarian crisis, Saudi is not solely responsible for it, but it plays a large part in it. What do you say about MBS's role in that? Look, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia is extremely anxious about what has been happening in Yemen. Yemen is on its southern border. It's its soft underbelly. You know, analysts can sit in London or New York and belittle Saudi anxiety. But Saudi has been watching Iranian encroachment into Yemen and watching the Houthis grow and develop. And suddenly they took control of the whole country and they had to go to war. Now, war always causes suffering. And it's very easy to, of course, we all, you know, abhor civilian casualties. But the hard fact is that the country is responsible for defending its internal security or its external security. And it felt it had to go to war. And there's a price. There isn't a single war that Britain or America or any other, you know, advanced Western country has undertaken that has not caused similar casualties. David Hurst. Well, I agree with some of that. I certainly think that uh, Saudi Arabia does have to protect its southern border. I certainly agree. And we chronicled the fact that the Houthis did take over uh, and they are Iranian backed. And where do they get their missiles from? I take all of that on board. But the fact is he launched a war which was supposed to be a quick blitzkrieg, then went on holiday to the Maldives, uh, shocking the uh, American Secretary of State. The Secretary of Defense. I mean, these rather. are small, irrelevant they people. They are not, because he's supposed to be no. the commander. And it was not and a blitzkrieg, by the way. And let then me, okay, but Ali Shahabi, let me, let me, let me you, just let, in terms let of. Let me just the, correct that point because okay, but, the Saudis had fought the Houthis years, five years before, and had a difficult time fighting them. So there was no illusions among the Saudi military leadership that this was going to be a okay, quick battle. Okay, but, but let's they get on to the, what was is actually happening haul, in that see? battle. And the office of the uh, UN Human Rights Commissioner put out a report last year saying that uh, in addition to markets, hospitals, schools, residential areas and other public and private infrastructure, the past year witnessed airstrikes against funeral gatherings and small civilian boats. That's the Saudi-led coalition. Well, small civilian boats have been used to smuggle arms. And the, the one funeral Markets, that was... Markets, hospitals, schools? Yes. You, what happens when you're fighting an irregular warfare with a non-state actor? They, they position and they use these sort of facilities to hide arms, to position arms, and sometimes to force you to lose the public relations war by bombing these sort of facilities. So it's, it is unfortunate. Also, mistakes happen. There's no doubt that the Saudi military has made mistakes, but they are not intentional. When people talk about war crimes, there has to be an intent to cause civilian harm. And there has been no proof brought that there was that intent. And David uh, Hurst, I mean, in terms, people have their concerns about what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in Saudi Arabia as well. But isn't the West right to say, look, th this is a man who is going to be in power in Saudi Arabia for probably for decades it's a very important country. We have to hug him close. We have to engage as an ally rather than grandstanding from the outside. Well, we certainly have to engage, but we also have to provide leverage. But in fact, the leverage is provided the other way around because he's got us over a barrel because Saudi Arabia is so important for British jobs. Uh, BAE would, would fold up without it. Uh, BAE are, are, are providing more typhoons to, to their Royal Air Force than they are to our own. The point is that this regime is becoming a source of regional instability. I've just come back from Amman in, in Jordan, uh, where they're spitting furious at, uh, the, uh, the, 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 at, at, at the, what Saudi has said about Jerusalem, about the right of return, and about the stability, which is it affecting actually the that, stability David. of the Jordanian state. Okay. Now, yeah, Jordan I mean, you have is to be not careful, enough of the Muslim David. Brotherhood. Gentlemen, you have to be um, careful uh, about the Ali accuracy Shahabi, of what you're I'm, saying. I was just saying to Ali Shahabi that we were going to have to leave it there. Um, the founder of the Arabia Foundation, Washington-based think tank, Ali Shahabi, uh, joining us from Washington, and uh, you also heard from David Hurst. He's editor-in-chief of the online news website, Middle East Eye. You're listening to News Hour from the BBC. Thank you.